as someone that did a lot of compressed eating periods, it wasn't hard for me to get, you know, 200 and something grams of protein in a compressed eating window. Yeah. But what would happen would flat out my caloric intake would be so low. And yeah. I used to say so much in the camp of just the low carb world that I kind of put calories out of my mind entirely, which ended up becoming deleterious to my performance in a lot of ways yeah. because I was, as long as I make my protein, you know, it's good, right? My protein needs are met. So I would fast, I would get in, you know, 250 grams of protein in a compressed period, but my caloric intake would be so low. Yeah. I put a link down below for Thrive Market. I know this is a relevant pitch for them, but at the same time, it makes sense. There's a 30% off discount link down below. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store, and it literally is their mission to make healthier food more available for people in areas that cannot get healthier food. They really wanted to make sustainability a real thing and be able to get real good, unprocessed, and even healthier processed food options into people's hands. So that link down below is a 30% off discount link for whatever you choose. You can fill up your grocery cart using that link, 30% off, plus a free $60 gift. So 30% off whether you choose some beet chips or whether you choose Siete tortilla chips instead of regular corn chips, or if you want jerky snacks or this or that. And a lot of the times it's gonna be much, much cheaper than you would find at many grocery stores. So that link is down below. It's in the top line of the description underneath this video. And again, 30% off and a free $60 gift. And I think we saw, uh, you probably know exactly what journal was published, but the, um, it just came out in February is, you know, the, the massive, um, review, the carbohydrate review, the non-narrative review, it was like, yeah. and it illuminated it in a different way for me talking about the carbohydrate piece where it was like kind of universal where it's like, it didn't really matter, you know, as long as glycogen stores were somewhat full, but what did matter was the calories that came in along with or without those carbs. It was like, okay, it didn't seem to matter if you had X amount of carbs 24 hours before your workout or not, but if your calories were lower the day before it did matter. And that's what I noticed. I used to feel like, okay, if I reduce my caloric intake, body composition, body composition, body composition, the next day I'm gonna be fine. In fact, I'll probably feel fresher because I'm gonna have less inflammation, yeah. all this crap, right? And then it got to a point where I'm realizing like actually what seemed to matter the most for me, whether my protein needs were met or not, yeah. was my previous day's fuel intake. So my point in all of this is in line with what you're saying. It's like, okay, I paid attention to the protein, but I was neglecting the calorie piece. And that's what's hard for me, for me to get enough calories in a four hour eating block. If I'm not just chugging olive oil and getting it in a clean way, that's actually tougher than the protein. I could get 200 yeah. grams of protein in, but it's gonna be 1200 calories or something. Yeah, the other issue you run into is that stuff will tend to work if you're keeping carbohydrates very low. Yeah. Why I'm saying that is if you're trying to ingest say three to 600 grams of carbohydrate, which is not incredibly high, certainly 300 is not super high for high performing for the average person who's working out three days a week, or, okay, that's different, right? Um, but getting in five, 600, 700 grams of carbohydrate can give you a ton of GI distress if you're bringing those things in in like two or three meals in, in, a, in a couple of hour window, right? And so that becomes really, really challenging. One of the things that we noticed a lot, we, we've seen this multiple times, is you may or may not notice physical performance changes quickly deleterious ones, right? So you may not drop muscle mass, you may not, your workouts might not change, but your physiology will start screaming. And if you start looking at markers, a really common one we have seen is you start seeing sleep disturbances. And it's like, okay, you're not having like insomnia, but you're definitely going down on sleep quality. And then we start looking deeper into physiology. One of the most common ones we've seen are things like this connection between sex hormone binding globulin, testosterone, and insulin. Uh, and so people don't realize that there's a very strong connection there. If your insulin gets too low because you're restricting calories too much or, and or carbohydrates as well because you're in these, one of these compressed eating windows, if that's the case, doesn't mean it's gonna happen, but it, it, you, just, you sort of brought this up. You yeah. said it happened to you, right? So just using your example. I would imagine your insulin started getting pretty low. Yeah, very low. If that thing gets low, you'll see an inverse association between that and sex hormone binding globulin. So that will go up. That will then mean it will bind and hold on to many of your anabolic protein, or it's particularly, or hormones rather, testosterone. So in that case, you'll see SHBG go up and testosterone go down. And now people are freaking out about their testosterone and they're doing all these things. If you start seeing subjective symptoms, poor sleep, poor recovery, and the other things associated with lower testosterone, and then we start looking at your stuff and we're like, well, like this is all caused. Like all we have to do is give your carbohydrate intake a little bit higher everything then gets auto-corrected and we've seen people's testosterone just take off yep. 
from that. And you will see that with global caloric restriction as well. So it's really, really, really common. In fact, there's data on people, on, on actually females, in this one study in particular I'm thinking, where they looked at, um, these were competitive, like fitness figure bodybuilders. I'm not exactly remember which one, but something like that. Pretty lean girls, pretty well done. Put them at 50% caloric restriction for 24 weeks, I think something like that. In response to that, you see a 40% drop in resting energy expenditure. You're just tanking. Adaptive thermogenesis is, is ending your day, right? So it's fine, you will lose a bunch of weight really fast, but all those people, uh, all those girls rather, I think they had something like a 30% testosterone drop. Yeah. They followed them for four more months after that, testosterone still had not returned, even though they took their calories back up to maintenance. Mm. So you're potentially running into issues that are going to last a long time. It's not to say fasting is dangerous or like any of those things. My only point is to say like, make sure you're looking under the hood as well because just because you haven't seen performance drop or your physique hasn't, or maybe it's going in the right direction. Yeah. Make sure you're also looking at other things because these, these, these folks were in trouble for a long time and it took them well past the three to four month range to get testosterone back and they still weren't at that level. No, I mean, for me, it was a matter of taking fasting down to two days a week and yeah. on the days that I do fast, as much as it goes against the grain of what my audience probably wants to hear, like those are my higher carbohydrate days. I counteract the fact that I'm really squelching everything. I'm like, okay, these are the days when I'm going to have yeah. my carbohydrate intake higher, whereas it used to be the opposite. It used to be, okay, let's stay in a ketogenic state throughout this. This fast was putting me in a ketogenic state. Let's maintain that and kind of continue this fat adaptation stuff for the rest of the day. When I was overweight, that was okay. But especially now being leaner and doing a lot more activity, it's very counterproductive for me to do that. So in the days when my calories are lower, I make a concerted effort to make sure that my carbohydrates are at least somewhat compensating for that. Yeah. Uh, nutritional ketosis in general is something I've absolutely changed my opinion. Yeah. On that. When that stuff first started coming on board, I was similar rhetoric as, as everybody else, like garbage, nothing, like all the negative things. That was certainly wrong. Um, I think once I took more time to appropriately pay attention to there, I, I think I actually probably landed in a spot that hasn't really changed in many years. I think I actually remember sending a tweet out probably like six or seven years ago that was like, hey, just be ready because we're about to see a landslide of pro and beneficial ketosis research. Yeah. People are like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, 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 not that people are gonna fake it, but just like, I think this is better than a lot of us gave it credit yeah. for. And it clearly is. Uh, we actually had one of our clients on our coaching program, we just put on it for the, like one of the few times ever, uh, he actually is going through brain surgery for brain cancer. There is a lot, a lot of research on a lot of good applications for nutritional ketosis, a lot of them. Um, more than I would have recommended. I actually am totally fine with people doing it for general population, especially people who don't exercise. If that works for you, great. Doesn't work for everyone. A lot of people gain weight on it, but a lot of people have great success with it. I would have really been negative about that 10 years ago. Now I'm like, hey, if that's what, great. Like I got no issue. I'm not gonna talk you out of that ever. I can't say a single time we've ever taken any of our high performers. That's what and I was going to be my I mean, next question, yeah. No, none of our athletes and none of our high performing executives uh, like never had them go on a ketogenic diet ever. Yeah. Uh, I don't see, there's no, well, there's clearly no special benefit yeah. for performance. And by performance, uh, I don't mean sports. I'm, I'm now saying like brain function, clarity. Yeah. I know people say this. Um, I don't believe it to be the case at all. I, I believe it's a lot of the, uh, especially 10, 15 years ago when I was first starting to do it, I think I saw a huge lift in brain fog and whatever you want to call it, simply because by the nature of especially what was available in terms of ketogenic foods then, yeah. by default, I was going to wholesome food. I was just, you know, eliminating the crap. I think now we're at a state now where people can do keto and still eat crap though. So yeah. I don't know if they're going to get the same benefits that I did maybe 12 years ago, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a difference of just uh, approach. That's why I say like if, if people are not super into nutrition, we don't have a lot of time and kind of like the best thing they can do is minimize a whole bunch of processed carbohydrates. That's a net win. Yeah. Like that's a very big win. And if, if that, if they feel good on it, they feel great, their energy stable and their body composition is in the right spot. And they're like, why would I, why would I want them to do yeah. something different? It's, it's clearly not dangerous for your long-term health. Clearly some people can adhere to it for a long time. Others can't, but that's the same of every diet. So that's not a real fair knock, right? That's fair. Where my position would differ on that a little bit is saying, okay, do we need to transition people to this? 
And the reason I'm saying we have never, or we really don't ever do that, is because if they are having a hard time with energy, um, if they're having a hard time with focus, or any of the other body composition things that people say like ketosis will fix, we've never run into a situation where we can't solve that problem without yeah. ketosis. Yeah. Something is going on. Something is happening in your physiology, um, in the way your me metabolic processes are running, your lifestyle, your sleep, something is going on internal in your biochemistry, something is happening there. To me, all you're doing is covering up science. Yeah. And you're, you're like, your body is screaming dysfunction, right? If you have a bagel and fall asleep, like, that's, that's not a healthy physiology. Yeah, that's not normal, yeah. No, yeah. like that is me going, oh, interesting. Yeah. Like not that you have to eat bagels to be healthy, of course, but my point of saying like, to me that as, as a coach and as a scientist, I'm looking at that going, oh, yeah. we've got work to do. Something is dysfunctional here. Yeah. Whether it is, again, any part of your physiology or about chemistry or your sleep, or like some part of you is dysfunctional. That's not a normal thing to have happen, right? If you have a bite of an apple, um, and you, you know, tank afterwards, like, okay, your blood glucose shoots to 200, we've got problems, yeah. right? And to me, just from my perspective, because of what we do and the budgets we work on, and the problems that we solve, avoiding the food is not the answer. Mm -hmm. I, I'm much more interested in going in like, well, no, let's fix that. That's a fixable thing. Yeah. And we, we do that continuously. If that's not your jam or you don't want to spend that time, I actually totally get it because there's many, many aspects of my life that I don't. It's like my finances and my health, like I, I, just fix it, I don't care. Like avoid it, don't do it. So that's cool, like I'm not. Like, and Galvin hasn't paid his taxes in nine years. No, that's the opposite. It's just more like pay them all, I don't care. <laughs> like just do whatever, right? Like I don't, finance guy, I don't break down why we did, like, just do it, I, I don't care, right? So I get it if people's jams are not like. For sure. Okay. I just wanna feel better right now. Yeah. Absolutely get it. Um, but it's sort, I, it's I, sort I, of like, you know, hey, my marriage is in shambles, so I'm just gonna pull the plug and get a divorce, you know, because the, mar the marriage makes me feel crappy, right? It's, that's an extreme example, but I- I'm Yeah, maybe the, we can use a better <laughs> example. <laughs> it's just more of like, my energy is low, I'll have more caffeine. Yeah. Okay, like, I mean, I do that. Okay. I will do that many more times the rest of my life, probably. But are you really, like, I'm more interested in scientifically going, all right, well, why? Yeah. Like, there's actually, that's, yeah. that's telling us something, that's a fixable problem. You wanna fix that? No, I wanna cover the symptom, cool. Oh, I want to fix that, so I don't have to do this anymore. Okay, now I get really excited. Like that's what we do, yeah. but that's not for everybody. No, I mean it makes perfect sense. I mean that's where I was 13, 14 years ago. Realistically, I was type two diabetic, and it was just like, okay, carbs are bad because they're. Oh every, really? Yeah. So every you know, oh. when I was really overweight, that was like that well, was. Well, I mean, so. geez, you know that's another good example. Like if you're type one diabetic, especially. No, type two diabetic. I know, but I'm oh, saying gotcha. if you are type one diabetic. Got it. The ketogenic diet makes pretty good sense. Yeah. Like, I would not have argued that, but now, I don't you have to, but it makes pretty good sense. Type two diabetic, maybe, maybe not, but if that's the path that you got, which was clearly there, like how could we argue that that's not awesome? Yeah. Clearly it was helpful for you. And it's still to this day, I, mean, I still have a little bit of <clears throat> glucose intolerance as a result of it, right? And like in some mm. ways, like the ketogenic diet for people that are glucose intolerant can actually, I don't wanna say make it worse, but I mean, there is no, evidence definitely. to suggest that you can make yourself more glucose intolerant. Well, dude, this yeah. is physiology, I told you. It's yeah. paying attention, right? Yeah. So if you run away from problems, you just think, yeah. you're always playing a game of sensitive and resilient. Yeah. The more you drive resilience, the less sensitivity you have, right? You're super dull. The more sensitivity you drive, you have no resilience. This yeah. is true of your physiology at all times. So everything you're doing in your physiology and your lifestyle is, is pushing on one of these two levers. Really easy example, take alcohol consumption, okay? So if you want to become really resilient to alcohol, you would drink more often, right? What that means is people that drink consistently can have a drink and not wake up incredibly hungover the next day. Yeah. If you never drink, you're very, very sensitive to alcohol, then one drink, you might feel terrible the next day, okay? So that's an easy example of saying, if I had to choose, it's probably better to be pretty sensitive yeah. to alcohol. It's probably not gonna be at a good spot where you can drink an entire bottle of wine and feel nothing the next day. Probably overly resilient on that one, right? So that one's a pretty easy choice. Other things are easier to say, okay, you actually wanna drive resilience here, like insulin right, like blood glucose, you should be resilient, um, like calories in general. Yeah. If you crash a couple of hours in your day because you haven't had a meal, you're overly sensitive, right? You're not resilient against not having food in your system. That's not a good spot to be in. Mm -hmm. You should be able to have a normal functioning day without any food. Every human being, that's an adult at least, should be able to go 24 hours without food, be fine cognitively, be fine emotionally, be fine physiologically. That's not a long period of time. Okay, if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I can't focus and I'm such a jerk right now because I haven't had lunch, like that's a sensitive physiology and that's not a good spot to be in. 
So that's a case where like we probably want to be more resilient. Other parts are like, now we're playing a game of like choice, right? So maybe you want to be more resilient because of your personal preferences or what you're going after, what you like more, and maybe someone else wants to be more sensitive to that thing. But everything that we're doing is, is you're playing a game of driving one side or the other. And so really thinking about what do I want to be resilient against and what do I want to be sensitive to? And then which ones do I want, don't want to be? But you have the power to change much of your physiology if you think about it in that context. Well, that's well said. I mean, I, I kind of learned that the hard way when I found that, okay, even when I would come off of a ketogenic diet, then it's okay, why am I getting this insane glucose response? Why do I have this? Peripheral insulin resistance was one thing, totally. but it was almost to a point of where I would, <clears throat> excuse me, it was almost to a point of where I would consume carbohydrates and I would feel like garbage, right? So then it would kind of revalidate. You're like, well, of okay, course. I guess I need to be, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm very pro ketogenic diet. Obviously I had a lot of success yeah. with it, but I've realized, especially as an athlete, like I've realized like, wait a minute, there is a very fine line here because now it gets to a point where the very thing that I might need to recover is actually feeling like an encumbrance to my day, which just sends me down this yeah. cycle. Yeah, and one would say the same thing for the idea of elimination diets. Yeah. Okay, so I eliminated dairy or gluten or plant based protein or limited animal protein, it doesn't matter, right? When you remove something from physiology, your body optimizes against it. That's basic physiology. So when you bring it back in, you better expect poor results, yeah. right? Like take anything out of your diet for two months and put it back in. Your body is gonna probably not digest it well, most of the time, right? So that you didn't learn anything about your physiology. What you learned is your body moved from, sensitive, from resilient to sensitive now. Right? And so when you don't have carbohydrates, and then you, if you are in nutritional ketosis for six months, and then you go have 200 grams of carbohydrates, you better expect to feel terrible. Why? Because you have physiologically down-regulated many enzymes from the stomach, to the intestines, to, to muscle, to tissue, to blood, that are there to process and manage carbohydrates. So they've been down-regulated. It's not that your body and your physiology can't do it. If you've just now optimized against that, and you've hit it with something it hasn't seen in a long time, and it's gonna throw the system into a whack, right? It's not for validation, like you said, that carbohydrates are bad for you. The same would be true for the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Dairy, proteins, all these things. You're like, oh, I, I took it out for seven days and then I put it back in and I got a huge GI distress. Like, well, what you learn is your body changes based on what you're doing. That's what you've learned. Just to round that out, like if you have run that stuff, and pay, you still want to pay attention to your body, right? Because there certainly are people who don't do well on gluten. Yeah. That's a real thing, for sure. Same thing with dairy. That's a real thing. I'm, anything else, I, when people say those things, I believe them. Yeah. Physiology is wonderful. It's, it's really complex. I believe all that stuff happens, right? But maybe we don't want to think about it, or I guess maybe if we think about it from the perspective of resilience and sensitivity, we won't jump the gun quite as much on the the thinking our physiology can't or can do something. It's kind of the difference between optimizing and maximizing, right? It's like, I yeah. mean, if you're constantly chasing optimization yeah. by removing or by fine tuning, there's a very small percentage of people, and I mean this with the utmost respect to a lot of people, but a very small amount of people that really need to be focusing on optimizing, right? A lot of people just need to be focusing on like, okay, how do I just get the most out of, out of my life rather than try to optimize just for this? And I think that's somehow where we've ended up a lot of times with, with the internet, it just kind of ends up that way where it's, I mean, algorithmically, you end up down a rabbit hole and you can say like, okay, I need to optimize this, 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 and this, and then you okay, well, you're now optimal here, but yeah. you're suboptimal everywhere else. I think, forget it's, the nature of the word optimize, right?